coming. Uh, welcome to the SOMOS Lecture Series for the fall 2015. We've got four lectures. This is the first of four. Uh, I'll just briefly state that next month we have uh, Ken Heck coming from University of Alabama, uh, Brad Peterson's advisor. Um, Brad Peterson, the faculty here. Um, so we're very excited to have him here. Um, the month after November, we're going to have a new professor at SOMOS, Roy Price giving a talk about the origins of life and searching for the origins of life in the ocean. Um, he does a lot of diving on hydrothermal vents. to figure that out, so I hired, and he's got some cool video, so you can see. And then finally, of course, in December, we have an extremely exciting lecture. Our own Amber Stubler, Dr. Stubler will be here to talk about sponges and coral reefs um, and interactions with ocean acidification. But tonight, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you all Dr. Mark Bond. Uh, he is a recent graduate from SOMAS, um, and he's from, I just learned, <laughs> I didn't even know this, from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, he did his undergrad degree at Cardiff University in marine geography. Who knew you could get a degree in marine geography? You can only get it from two universities in the UK. <laughs> two different universities. Um, he did his PhD at SOMOS under Damien Chapman, and, um, and he was instantly snatched up for a postdoc. He's headed, uh, and well, he's already started technically, at Florida International University, uh, where he's going to continue uh, his work in the Bahamas on shark populations. And so the title of his talk tonight is The Effects of Marine Reserves on the Abundance and the Ecology of Caribbean Reef Sharks and Southern Stingrays, Dr. Mark Bond. This thing is good. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm very excited to give this talk. Um, so yeah, basically, as Chris suggested or said, that this is a, a summary of my dissertation thesis that we uh, just recently completed here at SOMAS. So just a quick overview. Um, tonight's talk, we're going to look to see, first, is there any evidence that marine reserves benefit sharks? And we're going to use the term batoids for the remainder of the talks. But uh, basically, batoids just means all sorts of stingrays and skates in one group. Um, and to do that, we're going to conduct a literature review. Next, we're going to look, uh, is there any temporal evidence that reserves benefit sharks? And we're going to use a long line time series to monitor catch per unit effort and mean body length as indicators of change for these. Uh, following that, we're going to look, is there any spatial evidence that marine reserves benefit sharks? Are sharks resident? And do we see higher abundances of reef sharks inside marine reserves? And finally, we're going to follow that up with, what is the ecological role of reef sharks? There's a lot of speculation on this, but we want to see how do they influence the ecosystems in which they live? Do they do so by direct and indirect methods? And what are the potential consequences of their removal? So what is the global conservation of sharks? I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody in this room that unfortunately, based on number of studies from a number of different places in the world, shark populations don't seem to be doing so well globally. Uh, life history characteristics such as slow to grow, late to reach sexual maturity, and low fecundity, as in low number of young, make them extremely vulnerable to fishing. And based on uh, demands for shark fin, for shark fin soup in the Asian markets, and also their meats in many of countries, um, meat in many countries around the world, we're seeing that they're experiencing high pressure from fishing fleets, both as direct uh, targeted species and as bycatch, and also a lot of uh, loss of critical habitat through urban development. So a really great paper that came out last year by Nick Dolby said that of the current known 1,041 species of shark skates and rays, over a third of them, only a third of them are considered safe, and up to a quarter of them are at risk of extinction within our lifetime. So this is a group of fishes that really need some kind of urgent attention. So what are we doing to try and arrest these? What can we do? If this was a terrestrial species like the rhino, where we're also seeing an extreme decline in numbers, we could just increase enforcement. So we figured what works for one species would work in the other environment. So in the marine environment, we increased enforcement. Uh, obviously, this would not work for a number of reasons. The marine environment presents many challenges. It was obviously a cold water day that day. Um, and so we want to follow up with one of the tools that's being used to actually uh, try and arrest these declines is the implementation of marine reserves. Uh, 
So I just want to specify that when I use the term marine reserve for the remainder of this talk, I'm talking about an area of the sea that's closed off to all sorts of fishing, but also all other extractive properties such as offshore drilling, um, mineral mining, and things like that. So it's really a very well-protected area that excludes all type of fishing. So to assess this, we conducted a literature search, and our aims were where our study is located and what ecosystems, what are the study species, what type of survey methods were used, and whether they found reserve effects being positive, neutral, or negative, and also what type of study. So was the study spatial, temporal, or before-after control impact in design? So just to clarify the study site, the study signs, when we talk of reserve effects, we're talking about changes in four biological parameters. So that is a species density, biomass, body size, or diversity. So whenever we're talking about reserve effects, we're looking at one of those characteristics. Typically in this uh, instant, we're looking at density and biomass combined, and we're going to talk about relative abundance. And then we're also going to talk about diversity within marine reserves. Now, our study designs themselves could be spatial or temporal. So what you really want to think about here is a spatial study looks at, a, looks at differences between two areas. So we're looking at two reserves that are separated spatially. So that is one way to look at that. Another way to test the same thing for reserve effects is a temporal design. So here we're not looking at differences between two sites. We're looking at changes at one site over time. And then the gold standard between the two is a combination of spatial, spatial and temporal. Uh, and that's before or after control impact. So you have elements of both. So that really should be the gold standard when we're trying to determine whether or not marine reserves benefit sharks and rays. So what were the results of our literature search? We found that 177 studies um, conducted across all peer-reviewed literature can, uh, were performed on uh, sharks and rays inside marine reserves. So of those studies, of the ones that examined reserve effects, so changes in those parameters, only 15 of them were temporal in design, and eight of which were before or after control impact, and 36 were spatial. So we can already see that there's a prevalence for spatial survey design for answering this question. We can see that when we look at these results over time, that we're starting to see an increase in the number of studies that are conducted inside marine reserves, and we're also seeing that of these studies, most of them typically uh, assess aspects of movement, but we are, if we look at the green color here, seeing a number of studies that are testing for reserve effects. So where are these studies being conducted? Uh, as a South African, it pains me to give Australia credit for anything, but unfortunately, as we can see from this map, most of the studies are being conducted in Australia. Um, there are a few other hotspots around the world, but what we can take from this figure is there is very little geographical kind of separation of these studies. We're focused in very specific areas, and we're also focused in very specific habitat, because almost all of these studies are occurring on tropical coral reefs. So what sort of species? So given that we know that most of these studies are occurring on coral reefs, um, it's no surprise that most of these studies occur on coral reef species. Um, so almost all of these species occur on coral reefs. However, we can see that there is, even within coral reef species, there's a subset of species that remain the main evidence or the main subject of these studies. And those are typically reef-associated sharks, such as gray reef, white tip reef, and black tip reefs, and then also other things that we're seeing, such as southern stingrays and tiger sharks. And then finally, the main kind of crux as to why we conducted this literature search was we wanted to see what is the evidence for positive, negative, or neutral reserve effects. So those are changes in those biological parameters. When we look at sharks and battoids combined, we can see that obviously with green being positive reserve effects, we can see that there does seem to be the majority of evidence saying that yes, reserve effects or marine reserves do have positive benefits for sharks and rays. But an interesting trend comes out that when we separate these into battoids and sharks, we can see here that not only is there relatively few studies conducted on batoids compared to sharks, but also we can see here that almost three quarters of the studies that focus on sharks found positive reserve effects, but only a roughly a third found positive effects for batoids. So there does seem to be a difference between how sharks and rays, despite having very similar life history characteristics, respond to reserve establishment. So in conclusion, we can say yes, there is evidence that marine reserves do work for sharks. It does seem to be geographically and habitat limited. 
um, focused mainly on reef associated species and there does seem to be a deficiency in temporal studies and before or after control impact which seems to be the best way to assess these considering changes that are assessed spatially could be derived from other reasons versus the reserve effects but we'll get into that in a little bit more um, and it does seem to be that sharks and batwoods may differ in their response to reserve establishment. So one of the other things we found out is there's very little love for stingrays out there. Unfortunately, considering they're as equally threatened as sharks um, based on the Dolby paper, we really need to focus our research efforts on working more um, and looking at these reserve effects on stingrays. So based on the literature reserve, we, uh, based on the literature uh, study review, uh, we wanted to find out, is there temporal evidence that marine reserves benefit sharks in our study area? So to do this, we conducted a long line time series which monitored catch per unit effort and body length as indicators of change. And then we followed that up by looking to see, is there spatial evidence that marine reserves benefit sharks? Are these sharks resident and are they more abundant inside marine reserves? So to try and tackle these questions, we chose the Caribbean reef shark as our study species. Um, as the name suggests, it's widely distributed throughout the Caribbean in the Western Atlantic. It is the only reef-associated shark in the Atlantic, spending all of its life stages over coral reef habitat. Um, it is economically important because it's taken not only as a targeted species in the region, but also as bycatch. But more importantly, it's now becoming the mainstay of a burgeoning shark tourism industry and uh, ecotourism, which is extremely beneficial to the economies of most of these developing re uh, countries in this region. So it's really got a lot of value to it. It's also um, purported to be the apex predator on coral reefs, as in the top predator. So in Belize, which is where we conducted all of our studies, there is a commercial shark fishery. Um, it remains largely unregulated, but luckily they don't practice finning and they do harvest and retain the whole shark. Unfortunately, despite there being a commercial fishery, there's very little management, and the only management of this commercial fishery is the establishment of a network of no-take marine reserves throughout the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, which is uh, shown here in red, and that remains the only form of management for the shark fishery. But it also provides an amazing setup for us to start answering these questions. So the first thing we wanted to do is look at the time series, and to do so, we uh, conducted a longline survey, our long lines consisted of a main line that was anchored into the substrate at both ends. Off the main line, we had uh, 50 baited gangens, and these long lines were set both on the fore reef habitat and inside the lagoon. Each long line set for three hours, and we sat approximately uh, between 12 and 15 lines each year as part of our standard survey. So our study site itself was Glover's Reef Marine Reserves, which is as we can see here, this is the coast of Belize. The Mesoamerican Barrier Reef is the second largest barrier reef in the world, behind the Australian one. Um, and they have three coral atolls um, away from the Barrier Reef, and one of which is Glover's Reef here. Now, the cool thing about Glover's Reef is not only is it a very well-established marine reserve, but it's got a unique design, as in, in the center here marked in green is the no-take element. So no fishing is allowed in here whatsoever. But the entire atoll itself is deemed a general use zone. So you can fish there, but you're not allowed to fish with long lines or gill nets, which happen to be the two most uh, prevalent fishing methods for sharks in the country. So it provides us a really good uh, experimental setup. And here we can see the set locations of our long lines um, that we set for the uh, purpose of this study. So if we look at the results of the long line study that was conducted from 2001 till 2013, here we're looking at uh, length frequency distribution, and the colors in pink represent females, and the colors in blue represent males. Uh, the dotted lines are the age or the length of maturity. So we can see that males reach maturity a lot earlier than females. But what we can see is based on all of our time series, we did encounter all life stages of Caribbean reef sharks on both habitats. So both the lagoon and the fore reef have all stages, all life stages of Caribbean reef sharks. So that's great. Now, if we look at the catch per unit effort, which we expressed as number of sharks caught per 100 hooks per hour, and we look, we can see, despite there being some interannual variation, when we put our results into a model and examine the factors year, as in sampling year, and then habitat being lagoon and fore reef, we found that there was only the factor habitat came out as significant. So despite interannual variation, there appears to be no change 
in, uh, in relative abundance of sharks at this site. Um, however, we did seem to catch more Caribbean reef sharks on the fore reef habitat compared to the lagoon, but that really makes sense. And considering the design of the reserve, it doesn't really matter in which habitat they are, provided we're seeing a stable population. Uh, and we also looked at total length, so the length of each individuals. The reason we did that is uh, demographic studies have shown that a reduction in mean total length of your catch is an indication that that population is being overfished. So again, we used the same uh, methods as we did with our numbers, our catch per unit effort, and we fed our results into a uh, generalized linear model with the factors year and habitat. And again, neither year nor habitat were specific, so we can say, uh, were significant even, so we can say that this population appears to have a stable mean total length too. So that's great. So in conclusion, based on our uh, standardized longline survey at Glover's Reef, we can say that all life stages occur at Glover's Reef Marine Reserves, from newborns to gravid females. Our catch per unit effort was consistent with a stable population, which is what we would hope considering the reserve's been established for over 10 years. Uh, we found a higher abundance of Caribbean reef sharks on the fore reef compared to the, habitat, um, compared to the lagoon. And our total length suggests that the population is stable. So this is great. So we're seeing here that based on our reserve at Glover's Reef, this population of reef sharks appears to be stable. So by the population appearing to be stable, that would imply that they are protected from fishing mortality. And to do so, that would mean that they're spending a lot of their time inside these protected reserve boundaries. So that led us to ask the question, are Caribbean reef sharks resident at Glover's Reef Marine Reserve? And to do so, we conducted an acoustic telemetry survey. So we caught 34 Caribbean reef sharks of all sizes. We surgically implanted um, acoustic transmitters inside, um, and the transmitters lasted from 12 to 18 months in duration. And then we had a network or an array of these underwater listening stations, and they were both on the fore reef and inside the lagoon. And they had not complete coverage of the atoll, but enough that we thought that they were adequate for this survey. So our hypothesis was that reef sharks exhibit residency, and our prediction was that reef sharks fitted with acoustic transmitters would be regularly detected by our underwater receivers at Glover's Reef. So I just want to specify here that we're terming or we're describing the term residency is as an individual exhibiting largely uninterrupted occupancy of a set area. So here our individual is obviously our reef shark, our area is Glover's Reef Atoll, and our um, duration is the duration of the study, which was a calendar year. So for those of you that aren't familiar how acoustic telemetry works, if our underwater listening station is the red dot and the green circle around it is its detection range, our acoustically implanted shark swims into the detection range and we get a unique ID and a timestamp that proves conclusively that that individual was by that receiver at that time. So <clears throat> with that and based on the whole array, we collected a lot of data, but I just want to kind of briefly describe to you now how the, or to help you with the interpretation of this. So the figure that we're going to look at, each of these rows is one individual shark, and that is shown by the transmitter number. Each column down is the month of the year running from January to December. And then the shading of the square indicates the number of days that month that that shark was detected on at least one receiver within our array. So that's not number of receivers, that's just number of days within that calendar month that that shark was detected. And obviously that's shaded with the least number of days being white and the most number of days being dark. So here, the results of that study, we can see here all of our 34 individuals arranged from smallest shark here to largest adult down here. And despite a few individuals that decided not to play ball, uh, we see that most of our uh, sharks exhibited almost 100% uh, all year round residency. There was no evidence of any seasonal migrations. So that allowed us to say that our prediction was true and that Caribbean reef sharks appear to exhibit residency to Glover's Reef Atoll. However, so now we've got temporal data. So from our long line time series, we can show temporally, yes, that population appears to be stable. Now we can show that the population appears to be resident, but this is only being conducted at Glover's Reef, and this is one reserve. So we wanted to then expand that and say, do sharks benefit from marine reserves in general? So if we compared marine reserves to similar fished habitats, would we see a difference in the relative abundance of sharks inside reserves compared to these habitats?
Now to do this, we conducted a baited remote underwater video survey, or BRUV. Um, BRUVs are uh, something that's very close to my heart. They're extremely scalable. Um, they're unobtrusive, so we, whether we did have um, mortality on our standard long lines, it wasn't huge because we take all the necessary precautions. However, there's no risk of shark mortality with a beta remote underwater video. There's also no risk of bycatch. Um, we randomly generated our deployment sites using ArcGIS software, and we deployed them in depths of between 7.5 and, and 25 meters deep on the fore reef. We used the standardized bait source, which was locally caught sardines, um, and we used one kilogram of that bait, and then each camera was set down on the ocean floor for 90 minutes continuously. So just a quick close-up of one of our brubs. Here we have the underwater camera in the housing here. It's pointed forward. We have our bait arm, which would contain our one kilogram of sardines. And then this is all raised off the bottom on a, a frame, and this is oriented into the current with the idea being that the current will carry the smell of the bait off, and any individual that's attracted will swim up the Oda corridor and then get filmed by the camera. Um, this is then all led to the surface by a line and a surface float, and that just helps us recover the rigs once, the, uh, once they finish recording. So our four sites, we have Glover's Reef down here, which was the atoll that we just looked at for the long line survey. We then had another uh, marine reserve up here on the barrier reef, which was Key Corker. We had a fished atoll, which was Turnif Atoll here, and then a fished barrier reef site, which was Southwater Key. So if we look at our study design, we've got north, south, barrier and atoll for both marine reserves and fish sites. We also wanted to conduct uh, habitat surveys to see if there was a difference between our sites that could influence our results. So I'm not going to bore you with the details, but we took over 720 environmental measurements and we conducted habitat surveys assessing the amount and distribution of soft sediment, and we found that there was no significant difference between any all four of our sites. So regardless of whether this site was a marine reserve or a fish site, there was no difference in the habitat on the fore reef. So the analysis. We took our results and we constructed a delta log normal generalized linear model, or GLM. Uh, within the results, we had factors marine reserve, location nested within marine reserve, so the difference between the two, um, habitat and the environmental parameters. And this study had over 56,000 video minutes that needed to be analyzed. Um, I was not able to watch all of these myself, otherwise I would have gone blind. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank any of the undergraduates. You can see, Ray, oh, I just blinded you with a laser pointer, sorry. Yeah, this thing's strong. You could take down a satellite with it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank everybody that helped review the hours and hours of footage. Um, it was very, very much appreciated. Um, I'd also like to take a, a moment to say that although we could take counts of the number of sharks that we see per video, because each of our videos were standardized, so each one was 90 minutes and had the same bait, we decided to score our videos as presence absence. So although in this video you're seeing four individual sharks, or you will do if we watch the whole video, on screen at once, we only scored this as one. So we scored this as presence because, yes, there were sharks present on it. So we took the most conservative estimate of relative abundance. Um, we could have counted number of individuals, and that obviously would have inflated our results a little bit. Um, but one of the things that's very cool is that we only had videos with multiple sharks inside or on videos that were set inside marine reserves. So at none of our fish sites did we have more than one shark on the same brub at the same time. So the results. We can see here with our marine reserve sites uh, gathered on the left and our fish sites on the, uh, yeah, on the right. Now, we were able to sample through multiple years, so each of these bars is an individual sampling year. Unfortunately, we couldn't sample every site every year, so where you're seeing an asterisk, it was a year that we didn't sample, not that we saw no, uh, no sharks. But I would like to point out that we did sample uh, Turnip in 2013, however, we did observe no sharks. So if we look at this, the graphic tells a great story, but if we look at the results of our model, we found that only the fact of marine reserve was the only variable that had significant bearing, and it had a positive influence. So marine reserves were significant, had significantly higher relative abundance of Caribbean reef sharks compared to our fish sites. So in conclusion, we have our movement data that demonstrates residency. Uh, we have our temporal data that shows that the time series suggests that there are stable populations in marine reserves.
Um, and we have our spatial data when we compared multiple marine reserves to multiple fish sites that said, yes, reef sharks appear more abundant inside marine reserves. So based on our studies and based on the literature review, we would say that, yes, there is evidence that marine reserves could be an effective tool for shark conservation. So now that we know that we have this kind of awesome setup with our marine reserves, we wanted to examine what is the ecological role of reef sharks. So a very few and limited number of studies have found a correlation between the number of sharks on a reef and healthy coral cover. But I'd just like to stress now that this was merely a correlation and not necessarily a causation. However, it has led, based on this little empirical evidence, for us to assume that the removal of reef sharks from coral reefs will induce trophic cascades, and that therefore um, would obviously unbalance the ecosystem and create potentially a shift from a coral-dominated system to an algae-dominated system, but we'll explain that a little bit uh, later. However, based on the fact that we now know that we have a higher abundance of reef sharks inside reserves compared to fish sites, we can use these reserves as a great experimental setup to test what is the difference in ecosystems where you do have reef sharks or where you don't. Um, and we wanted to examine the direct and indirect effects that they have on their ecosystem. So just to clarify what direct effects are, uh, essentially it's direct predation. So you have your predator. Um, and by directly killing its prey, it reduces the number of the prey. And therefore, there is a density-mediated indirect effect to a third party, as in the prey's prey. So a great example of this is our sea otters. So uh, sea otters removing the, or reducing the numbers of urchins and reducing the urchins' grazing potential um, allowed the kelp forest to flourish. So that's kind of a practical example of this. So if we focus on the Caribbean, um, a great paper that came out in 2000, um, 2005 by Bas Compte showed this really simplistic food web model of the Caribbean. Uh, no, I'm joking. I have no idea. I've read this paper about 15 times, and I still can't follow this figure. Uh, however, to break it down in really simply uh, nice, colorful pictures, we have reef sharks that fulfill the apex predator role on the top. Uh, they then prey uh, primarily on large-body piscivores, such as barracuda and grouper species which then in turn prey on herbivores, and this is your kind of typically common uh, trophic pyramid that you would see. Now, I'd just like to stress that this is based on very few uh, diet data and very small um, sample size, and it's still a model. It's not necessarily an actual um, test. So how the trophic cascade would happen, or this predicted trophic cascade, would be that the removal of reef sharks would therefore increase the number of their prey that would therefore increase grazing pressure or predation pressure on herbivores. And in this case, that would lead potentially from a coral-dominated system to an algae-dominated system with the reduction in herbivores. But again, this is all based on a model. So we really need to be careful with making these assumptions and these far-reaching conclusions. So how did we test this uh, for our study? So we thought it would be a little bit hypocritical for us to go and kill a bunch of reef sharks and look in their stomachs. So instead of examining their diet through that, we use the uh, unobtrusive method of stable isotopes. So stable isotopes of 15 nitrogen and 13 carbon, or 15N and 13C, not isotopes are transferred from producer to consumer with relatively predictable changes. So here we could say predator-prey as opposed to producer or consumer. So delta 15N experiences, uh, delta 13C even, experiences minimal changes between each trophic step, so between each level in your food web. However, nitrogen becomes enriched at approximately 3.4 parts per thousand per trophic level. Now, there is currently a lot of debate within the isotope field about this exact number, but for the purpose of this study, we can just take it as kind of the additive 3.4 per trophic level. Now, our delta 13C allows us to help trace the primary producers at the base of that food web, where the individual is obtaining its food. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is where the predator is eating its, where its prey is, but it could necessarily be the signal from the prey's prey. So we just have to be very careful with the conclusions we make from that. Um, and then the nitrogen provides an estimate of trophic level, as in how high up in the food web is that individual feeding. Now, marine food webs are extremely complex, as that figure showed. Um, so this is a really useful tool in helping to try to delineate that. Uh, we sampled white mussel, which has a typical turnover rate of one year. Therefore, the isotopic signatures that we're seeing reflect 
the assimilated diet of that individual for the whole year. So we can't really say specifically like we would do with stomach contents, this shark eats this type of fish. But what we can say is, over the course of a year, this shark was feeding at this approximate trophic level, therefore it's probably eating these species. Uh, we sampled 86 reef sharks, 50 barracuda, 27 black grouper, and unfortunately um, a moratorium on retaining Nassau grouper in Belize meant that we were only uh, able to opportunistically sample six of them. But it was enough for the results for this study. So here if we look at our uh, nitrogen carbon biplot, now here we're looking at the mean and standard deviation for each of our species. First here I'd like to draw your attention to kind of the horizontal axis. So this is our carbon. Now typically you find less depleted carbon comes from coastal sources such as seagrass and more depleted carbon uh, comes from pelagic sources such as on the coral reef. So we can kind of use this as a way to describe where our individual is feeding. Now here we can see the first thing that jumps out is all of our study species have extremely broad carbon ranges. So it appears that they're feeding across a range of habitats. They're not necessarily specifically sticking as a species to one habitat or the other. So that was a really surprising result that we didn't expect. Now if we look on our vertical axis that is our nitrogen and tells us where in the trophic pyramid we're feeding, we can see that unlike the predicted result from the BASCOMP model, our Caribbean reef sharks, which are ZII here, so uh, Carcharhinus perizae, if the Bascompt model was true, we would expect Caribbean reef sharks to be sitting right up here, way above our barracuda and our black grouper and our nassau grouper. So it appears that that predicted model was incorrect, and reef sharks don't have a diet that primarily consists of nassau grouper, uh, black grouper, or barracuda. So that was very surprising. A couple of the other things that tended to not agree with that predicted model is when we ran our uh, nitrogen value versus our total length and looked for ontogenetic shifts in diet, that model would suggest that larger Caribbean reef sharks are capable of eating larger piscivorous fish, therefore we should see an increase in nitrogen value with total length, but instead we see that there was no significant increase both for males or females and the population as a whole. It appears there is no change in where in the food web these individuals are feeding as they get larger. However, one of the most interesting results that came out of this is we found that there was a significant increase or a significant increase in carbon when these individuals are getting larger. So instead of a larger shark, or a shark that grows eating larger prey, we're not seeing that. We're seeing a shark that grows changing potentially where it's gathering its carbon from. So maybe feeding in a different habitat as it gets larger. So that was a really interesting and very surprising result from this. So if we think back to that original model and what was predicted based on that uh, diet study, we had our Caribbean reef shark thought to be the apex predator at the top of the coral reef that fed primarily on our large piscivores and our herbivores, and the trophic cascade would happen if we removed our top predators, we'd have an increase in our mesopredators that would in turn reduce the number of um, lower trophic level species, in this case herbivores. <coughs> However, our isotope results did not show the same thing. We didn't see Caribbean reef sharks sitting really at the top of that food web and primarily eating those large piscivores. So although our results showed that there is, it's unlikely that we would have a strong trophic cascade with their removal, it didn't tell us exactly what is driving that. So there are two potential mechanisms that could produce the result that we saw. The first being functional redundancy, as in all of our species here, our Caribbean reef sharks, our large-bodied piscivores, all primarily eat the same thing. So therefore, if you removed, in this case, uh, parrotfish. So therefore, if you removed one of these species or depleted the numbers of one of these species, you wouldn't necessarily see a trophic cascade because there are other species fulfilling the same ecological role. So if they remove one, then there's still three other species that can perform the same function. So that's just one potential outcome. The other being omnivory. So we don't remember how our uh, isotope result is the assimilated diet, not actually specific species. So therefore, we could have a scenario where our Caribbean reef shark is preying on our large-bodied piscivores, but they're also preying on herbivores. And between the two, the assimilated signal brings the value of the Caribbean reef shark's nitrogen lower than what we would expect. So although we can't distinguish exactly what is the mechanism, based on our isotopes, it appears that either one of these is probable, 
But the conclusion from this is that that strong trophic cascade that was predicted based on the uh, BASCOM paper seems unlikely. We also saw that our isotopes suggest omnivory or functional redundancy for the role of Caribbean reef sharks. We surprisingly saw no ontogenetic increase in nitrogen, but we did see this change in carbon, which potentially is representing larger reef sharks that we know hang off at depth uh, off the atoll during the day, coming up at night to the lagoon, which we've shown from our um, movement data. So potentially they're spending their day down at depth, but actually coming up into the lagoon in the shallow water at night to feed. So that provides a really cool energe uh, energetic pathway between the deep environment and the shallow lagoon environment that we definitely want to look more at in the future. So if we remember the results of our literature search, we found this interesting trend where there was significantly more positive reserve effects for sharks when studies were conducted inside reserves compared to batoys. Now, given what we've just learned about shark abundance inside marine reserves and how it appears to be higher, we wanted to see, is there a connection between these two? So to do that, we looked at the indirect effects. So as we had before, our indirect effects have our predator, and instead of numerically removing our prey and changing its number, it just alters our prey's behavior. So this is kind of like, if you're driving down Nichols Road and you're bombing along at 70, everyone else is bombing along at 70, so that's fine for you. As soon as you see that cop car, you notice everybody slows down. So that would basically be kind of a real life situation of this. So you'd have your predator, and just the mere presence of the predator alters the prey's behavior. So you can have huge cascading effects that go through an ecosystem without an individual actually even being killed or removed, just through changes in behavior. So a really, really great example of this from the marine world um, is the work by Mike Heithouse down in uh, Shark Bay in Australia. So they have a seasonal influx of tiger sharks to this area, and they found that bottlenose dolphin, the prey of um, potential prey of tiger sharks, actually give up feeding in really prey-rich areas to go feed in prey-poor areas just because the prey-poor areas have very little predation risk because they're deeper. So they allow the ability to escape should there be a tiger shark present. Therefore, the prey-rich areas where the dolphins would normally be if there wasn't the risk of tiger sharks, they get relaxed predation, so therefore the dolphin's prey is able to go about itself in a different way. So we can have these indirect effects be just as powerful as our direct effects. So they always warrant consideration. So when we looked at our ecological role, we have our Caribbean reef sharks as our main study species, um, and we wanted to look at their potential role on other mesopredators. And our null hypothesis was that reserves will have no effect on elasmobranchs that aren't fished. So we're seeing this difference in abundance in reserves of our Caribbean reef shark, probably because of the reduction of fishing pressure. So we would expect that we wouldn't see the same result in a species that wasn't fished. So to look at this, we uh, looked at our daisyated family, primarily Daisyatus americana and Hymenchura schmade. I love saying that for some reason. Um, both are benthic stingrays. They're both found on hard and soft sub, uh, substrate, but they prefer soft, soft substrate because uh, most of their prey is, is buried within that, and it also gives them the opportunity to refuge and hide from predators. Uh, both in, uh, inhabit a wide depth range, and both are not... Uh, commercially targeted, so we would expect to see no difference uh, between our reserves. And they are both established prey of sharks. So we're quite familiar. We used the same four study sites as we looked at for our relative abundance study. Uh, we've got our two reserves and our two fish sites. And here you can see uh, one of the Hymenchura Shmade getting quite uh, excited about the prospect of bait. One of the cool things about these is they never actually get to the bait, so you can almost watch their frustration grow as the video goes, and they get more and more aggressive trying to get to the cage. So remember how we looked across all four of our study, uh, study sites and showed that there was no difference in the habitat on the fore reef? Because stingrays inhabit both fore reef and lagoon habitats, we wanted to survey both. Um, and to do so, we looked at our uh, lagoon habitat and found again from a broad scale there was no difference between any four of our sites besides the fact that two of our sites were marine reserves and two of our sites were fished. So we deployed cameras both on the fore reef and on the lagoon and we constructed two different models so we compared apples to apples and oranges to oranges. We had one for uh, our fore reef flats 
uh, four reef uh, videos and one for our lagoon and our flats videos. We use the same factors, so marine reserve, location nested within marine reserve, habitat, in this case, um, uh, whether it was an atoll or a barrier reef, and then our environmental parameters. And this study, again, looked at over 70,000 minutes of video, and a huge thank you to everybody that helped me watch those. Um, so <clears throat> now if we look at our results, and we're just focusing on sharks now, and we're looking at four reef only. So we can see, same results as before. We have our higher relative abundance of Caribbean reef sharks compared to our fish sites on the four reef. Again, same. The only factor that was significant was marine reserves. However, you notice now if we look at our flats and we're looking at stingrays. So we're looking at both flats and four reef. We saw no Caribbean reef sharks inside the flats, which is why we didn't show the data. There was not a single Caribbean reef shark observed in those really shallow flats. However, now if we look at our stingray data and we just focus on our fish sites, so our flats, our lagoon, are the blue bars, and our four reef is the red bars. And we can see there's no significant difference between the abundance of stingrays in the flats and on the lagoon and on the four reef in our fish sites. However, if we look at our reserve sites, we can see that there is, although no difference between the relative abundance of stingrays on the flats, we can see there are significantly fewer stingrays on the four reef in our marine reserves. And again, our model showed that the only factor that influenced stingrays um, and had a significant impact was uh, habitat, and it had a negative impact. So we saw significantly fewer uh, stingrays on the four reef inside our marine reserves. So what is potentially driving this uh, distribution pattern or this difference in abundance between reserves and our fish sites? So here if we look along the lines of behaviorally mediated interactions, here we have our reserves, so we have plenty of sharks out here on the fore reef and st uh, stingrays inside the lagoon. So we have our stingray that ventures out onto the fore reef, int potentially interacts with a shark, therefore it stays inside the flats. So because there is this increased chance of interaction or encounter with these individuals, we think that potentially they could preferably stay inside the areas where we didn't see any sharks. So if we see our fish, uh, fish reefs here, when we look at the same trend, obviously we know from our relative abundance survey that there were very few uh, Caribbean reef sharks on the four reef at our fish sites. Therefore, our stingray can venture out onto the four reef, have a little spring break without the increased risk of predation that we would expect on our, inside our marine reserves. So this kind of broader, this wasn't something that we initially started to look at. This was a trend that came out um, after the first couple of years of the study and then just kept getting stronger the more we looked at it. Um, and in conclusion, we were able to find that stingrays reduce the use of deeper fore reef and riskier fore reef when sharks are present. This is an indirect effect of reserve establishment. So this isn't something that anybody that went and created marine reserve anticipated. But it is something that really needs to be considered, especially when designating future marine reserves, because it has consequences for seagrass community structures. So stingrays are great bioturbators. They dig in the sediment a lot. They can break up seagrass patches as a result. And they can also uh, forage intensely on um, uh, uh, macroinverts and things living in the sediment. So by shifting their abundance or their distribution to one habitat over the other, we could really, really influence um, the habitat that they're then concentrated on. So our overarching conclusions from the whole talk are that we see that we need, there is a need for more time series and before after control impact studies um, to assess whether or not we have a, there are benefits for marine reserves um, for sharks and rays. Um, marine reserves have a higher abundance of sharks in coral reef ecosystems. Again, our map at the very beginning shows that we really need to expand and try and look at these in other systems, maybe temperate or rocky reefs. Uh, reef sharks appear to form part of a top predator guild and not what was previously assumed, as in they are the apex predator on the coral reef. Um, one of the questions is, well, what is the apex predator? So we believe that potentially it's more um, mobile species and larger bodied shark species such as tiger sharks, great hammerheads, bull sharks, things that don't necessarily exhibit the same amount of residency. Therefore, we don't sample them as regularly when we work inside the reserves, but they are present. Um, and there is this potential for these indirect effects of predator restoration or removal. So this is kind of relaying to what we've just seen with the stingrays, how they're concentrating in one habitat over another based on the risk of predation.
So with that, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, I'd in particularly like to thank our boat captain, Norlin, in Belize, and Bert. Without them, I wouldn't be able to have done any of this work. Uh, Don King or George was also hugely helpful. Um, my advisor, Damien, um, other scientists and committee members that have helped with this project, such as Beth Babcock, Nigel Hussey, um, all the Earthwatch volunteers that uh, came out and made the, this possible through their funding, um, all the Stony Brook volunteers that helped watch videos. I uh, see Gina here, so all Chapman members, lab, past and present. Thank you very much for your support. Um, and then the funding institutes. And with that, oh, I would like to take credit for the photos in this talk, but unfortunately I'm not as gifted with the camera as friends of mine. So uh, all photos were provided by Andy Mann, Matt Potensky, or Sean Williams. And with that, I would like to take any questions, if you have any. So if that was the case, then we would expect to see a lower relative abundance across all habitats at each site, but we didn't. We saw that there was a comparable number of, habit a comparable number of uh, stingrays relative abundance-wise across all sites. Like with it, sorry, across all habitats within our reserve sites. We didn't see that reserves had significantly fewer stingrays. We just saw that they were distributed differently. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where that came from. That's definitely not my that's definitely not my music either. I don't know where that like sleazy French jazz came from. Um, but yeah, so basically, we would have when we were looking at our uh, our four sites. If it was uh, the case that we would have direct removal, we would expect to see in our reserve sites a lower relative abundance of individuals. But we didn't. We just saw that they were distributed differently. You're giving me the weird eyes, so clearly that wasn't the, uh, okay. Um, yeah, anybody else? Yes. Would there be any chance, like you were talking about the top predatory guy, uh, could there be airborne predatory guys that were factored in that may be... To influence, uh, to influence population? sharks? Um, I'm unaware of, I mean, I know... I mean, humans or birds or what? Not Sharknadoes, is that what you just said? No, <laughs> definitely not. They're not real people. <laughs> I hate to burst that bubble. Um, so, to be honest, I've only ever heard of one case of a seabird uh, killing a shark, and it picked it up and dropped it on a golf course because it was too big for it to carry. Um, we didn't look at anything outside of the marine world, so uh, if there is, we didn't study it, so no. I mean, it, it's potential. Uh, but uh, no, we didn't find any other kind of airborne predators. We, are you kind of more talking about environmental parameters, such yeah, as no, like? Oh, okay. Out of the box, thinking, okay, you know, you know, poke, poke, you know, poachers, you know, poaching, poaching. Poaching, right. So the cool thing about our reserve sites is both are very well enforced. So that was one of the reasons why we chose the sites that we did. Belize actually, from the map that I showed at the beginning, has a ton of marine reserves. But some of them are so small that we didn't think that they would even be effective reserves for that benefit. And others just have almost no enforcement. So essentially, they're a paper park. I'm hoping no more crazy music pops up. <laughs> Chris. So there. I guess what I'm wondering is, is uh, my bigger question would just be about the, the total food web structure there. So okay. The, and you know, could you, would, if you did the amphibian, is there evidence that if you did the amphibian, the herbivorous fish, it would come up you know, th that step lower? And, uh, so what we would try to do initially, and this cost me about six weeks, was develop a mixing model that would potentially look at the differences and maybe give us an indication of prey proportions that ended in that result. Um, unfortunately, with these Caribbean coral reef ecosystems, there's just so many energetic pathways that 
I mean, literally, I spent six weeks banging my head against the wall, and I went to a number of isotope experts with my results, and they were all like, no, that's not right. And then eventually I found one person that said, well, a mixing model is completely inappropriate for this because that system's just so complex. So there's, we never, I doubt unless we start looking directly at stomach contents, we're ever going to be able to say specifically what they're eating. But what we didn't necessarily go out there to try and do that, we just wanted to see is that cascade actually as strong as it's predicted and based on the results, no, it's not. Um, I'd like to look at that more and I'd also like to look to see if there's a change in um, trophic position inside and outside of marine reserves. Unfortunately, we didn't catch enough sharks outside of marine reserves to be able to answer that question, but uh, that would be something I'd like to look at. And I can just follow up. Is there any, I sort of, there's no trophic cascade, but is there any evidence of the, uh, which would, I guess, could result in the overgrowth of the algae on the reef, but is there any evidence of the reefs are distinctly different within the reserves compared to outside? I suppose there's more fish and therefore there, overall there is less algae, right? Do you mean from the coral, from a coral cover point of view? Yes. Um, so there doesn't, we didn't look at that. Um, I would love to have, um, but we didn't. And uh, that's actually something that I'm going to do on my postdoc. But uh, based on the, like just me jumping in the water for five years at these sites, I would say actually no, because some of the best coral structure and coral cover is actually inside one of our fish sites, uh, which was surprising for me. But um, no, I didn't see any evidence that could say conclusively, yes, there's less or more grazing. I know there have been studies at, my, um, at Glover's Reef that have looked at uh, grazing rate with Pete Mumby's students, um, but I didn't delve into that too deeply. I think there was a... Uh, yes, and did you reach a conclusion as to whether it's desirable to establish more marine reserves in order to preserve the sharks, or did you conclude otherwise, or perhaps conclude nothing? I'm not sure. Okay, so yes, we concluded that uh, Caribbean reef sharks appear to benefit from marine reserves. So in our system, yes, reserves do work. They are an effective conservation tool for this species. We've so shown that based on the studies around the rest of the world, again, there seems to be a lot of evidence that says marine reserves do work. However, it's limited to shark species that spend their entire life cycle over coral reefs, and we've only really strongly demonstrated that they do work in coral reef ecosystems. So we've got evidence that they're appropriate in certain systems on certain species, but we can't say for certain that rolling them out as a blanket conservation tool would work for other species. And obviously, it doesn't necessarily work for batoids, which are just as imperiled. So we really need to kind of show them some love and figure some stuff out for them, because unfortunately, they'll all be extinct by the time we get around to it. Yes? So I can't speak on any of the other countries, but within Belize, we're working with the government, of Fish, uh, government Department of Fisheries, and they are quite supportive, but not for the same reasons. So they don't see uh, marine reserves as a way to conserve stuff. They just see them as a way of, it's like a fishery, fisheries management tool. So they're just looking at reserves work because we're now getting the greatest lobster and conch catches just on the borders of the reserves. Um, because the sh uh, commercial shark fishery in Belize doesn't generate an incredible amount of income, they're not really looking at ways to keep it. So we had to approach them as to putting in management restrictions and things. So those reserves weren't set up to manage sharks. They just happened to do so incidentally. Um, we haven't had, uh, so one of our study sites um, has now recently, Turnip, the other atoll, is now a marine reserve. It's not on for enforced just yet, but there does seem to be a kind of mo uh, momentum to make more marine reserves, but not necessarily because of what they're going to do for sharks, but if they're, if they're created, we don't care why they're created as long as they're there. So um, they do seem to be supportive of more marine reserves. But I can only speak on Belize. I couldn't speak on the rest of the region. I know well, Honduras is a shark sanctuary, so you're not allowed to catch or attain any shark species in the whole EEZ. So um, the region, I would say, has a lot of room for improvement, but it's moving in the right direction, except for Costa Rica, which is in a lot of trouble. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what we're hoping to get to next. If you have any contacts in Cuba, let us know. Yes, well, uh, Anderson Cooper was there. They filmed in 60 minutes. Right, in the Queen Gardens, Queen Elizabeth Gardens, right? Yeah, that looks beautiful. Uh, I mean, we're definitely trying to get there. As soon as those, I mean, it's not a problem for me because I'm not American, but uh, for you guys, you have some issues. Um, but yeah, no, we're definitely trying to get there. As part of the global study we're going to be doing, um, part of my postdoc, Cuba is one of the top, top priorities. Because it's going to show it, because obviously it was very well controlled as to where they could fish. So their marine reserves are not just marine reserves that were fished originally. They've been almost pristine for a number of decades now. So it would be a great, great setup to look at. That is a great question. Um, I think, you know what, no one's ever asked me that. That is amazing. Uh, it could just be marine reserves, but just doing it in separate habitats. So maybe we look at um, conserving flats in certain areas and not the fall reef. Um, you know what, I actually haven't thought of that at length, so I can't give you like a really confident answer, but that's an amazing question. I will. Uh, I'm definitely going to look into that. To be honest, we don't really know. The, one of the main reasons why so many of those species are in such bad shape is we just don't know anything about their basic life history. So we don't know if that stingray has the same gestation period as a shark. We don't know if it gives birth to one pup or 50. So we really need to kind of learn these fundamentals to help generate answers to questions like yours. Um, you know, we just have to collect that basic information. And we just have to have people willing to allow us to take an area of the sea and just stop fishing so it allows us to gather that info. Um, but yeah, great question. Yes. Um, I don't want to cut graduate students out of work, but is there any computer imaging that can be done at this point? We are work species? We're working on it right now. Individual. Yeah, so I agree. I mean, I'm sure all the undergraduates would agree that they would rather, there's plenty of other things they'd rather be doing than watching videos, except Rachel, who loved it. Um, but, uh, yeah, if we could cut out, I mean, you just saw the best clips. There's just hours of dead, well, not dead sea, but, like, dead footage with nothing interesting happening at all. Um, and so one of the things that we're working with right now is an algorithm that will be able to detect, watch videos and just say, look at 23 minutes, look at 33 minutes. I don't know if it's going to be good enough to tell us species, but it will definitely be able to tell us that it's a shark or something else. So it was... You know, I mean, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. I think we're a really long way off. Just because the same individual can make a pass at a completely different angle or a completely different visibility day, and that's going to heavily influence whether or not it can pick up. So you look at the guys that are doing the individual ID on the whale sharks, and they have to be, like, this close to the whale shark to get, like, a decent footage and be, like, 100% that's a different, the same whale shark. And we just don't get that, or from this survey method, we don't get that resolution, I don't think. Can you put four cameras around at some point? We could do. The research costs get up really steep pretty well, quickly. Yeah. But, uh, one, one, what does one drug cost? Uh, great question. It really depends on the country. But in Belize, well, we redid these with stainless steel because the rust killed everyone. Um, so I would say about $500 for the rig and the camera, and then you still have to bait it. Um, but, it, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're using this method is because it's far less expensive than anything else. Like, before to get abundance data like this, we'd have to use long lines. So you have to fish for the bait to the long lines. You have the cost of the long line gear, and every time you catch a shark, you probably lose a hook. It might even lose a ganjin, depending on how much gear it, it destroys. So it's really, really cost effective. Um, but, uh, so I spoke to a guy at a conference a while ago, and he developed, like, a box so it was like almost like when you go into a photo booth, you have a, a material box here, here, and here. And then when the individual swam into that box, it took out all the background noise. So you could get really specific species ID. Um, so I think that would probably be the best way to do what you're trying to ask. But I don't know if it's possible just yet. 
Right, so we did do tissue samples. We did collect wherever we could. Um, there's very little population genetic structure in a Caribbean reef shark. Um, my advisor actually tried to do that for his masters and failed miserably just because there wasn't enough uh, variation between the Bahamas and Belize, let alone within one atoll. Um, I think what we would like to do is try and do, create a pedigree of the reef sharks, uh, like a genetic pedigree. Um, the other members of our group have done that very successfully in the Bahamas with lemon sharks. Now that we've demonstrated that there is this residency, we would like to try and answer that question, um, but we haven't done so yet. Yes, come back, Sam, sorry. So uh, females reach sexual maturity later and larger. Um, yeah, so basically uh, tip females are typically larger than males, which is why we see that drop off in the number. So you see when it gets to like the higher lengths, it's just pink, pink, pink. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so that's just because the females are, uh, females are, are larger than the males. So typically females reach sexual maturity around about 180 to 200, and the males are about 150 to 160. Sorry, centimeters total length. Sam. So, just going back to the question of the rays, um, if I understand, um, the reason you're saying is because you, reserves don't work for the rays that don't appear to work is because there is no, no effect of uh, in relative abundance based on whether or not you were inside or outside the reserve, right? No. We, what we were saying is we wouldn't, because rays aren't fished, we wouldn't expect to see a reserve effect. Okay. So that's why we would, we would have expected there to be no significant difference on any of our surveys for stingrays in our reserves or our fish sites because there's no fishing pressure for them, so they shouldn't be influenced. So we believe that the relative abundance differences that we saw for sharks and marine reserves was because fishing mortality outside. So we expected to see no difference. But then we did see that difference when we saw that there was significantly fewer on the fore reef, but no difference on the, in the lagoons. Yes. Um, you have to establish a residency of sharks. Um, is it an assumed behavior that they were migratory before that, or is this like an individual behavior that was being established by the team? Uh, it's not unusual. It's, very co it's now becoming evident that it's increasingly common in ca uh, coral reef species. So. Um, this, the reason that we looked at it from a seasonal migration point of view is because uh, if they are making these seasonal migrations outside of the reserve, then they would obviously be exposed to potential fishing mortality. Um, it's not always assumed. In the Baha say, for example, in the Bahamas, Caribbean reef sharks do exhibit a seasonal migration, and we think that's because of the difference in latitude. Um, however, in this study site, we didn't exhibit that. So we wanted to test to see if that was going to be the case. But uh, most of our individuals were detected on more than two weeks of each month for the whole calendar year. So uh, we did have individuals, mind you, I should say, we did have individuals that made single migrations to a point and come back. Like if we, oh, sorry, I'm not very good on these ones. Oh, well. Um, so yeah, basically, if you look, one of our atolls is here, and then there's another atoll here, which is called Lighthouse. And that's, uh, there's another research group doing work there, and they had underwater receivers too. And one of our reef sharks got detected on her receiver and then was back, and it's like a 60-kilometer distance between the two atolls, and she did that journey in 10 days. So we last detected her, and then she was detected on um, uh, Rachel's receivers five days later, and then exactly five days later again, she was detected back at Glover's. So they do make migrations outside of the atoll, but what we don't see is an extended period of time outside of the reserve. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much.